I kind of got into it at a very young age when I was um, seven or eight years old. My, my grandmother had um, one of those wind up gramophone things. And, you put, and they had this big needle. And my very first record was one she gave me. It was called uh, Red Sails in the Sunset by, by a guy called Tab Hunter. And um, I guess that was my first introduction to, to music at the time. And then, having grown up in England during the 60s, um, th there were commercial radio stations that were offshore. Did you ever see the movie Pirate Radio? That sort of conveyed a little bit of what, what was going on in England during the 60s with, with the BBC severely limited by a thing called needle time. So they couldn't play more than nine minutes an hour of music, recorded music, which was kind of a little stifling on the industry. So along came these pirate stations in 1964, playing 24 hour a day pop music. And um, that got me interested because I, I would listen to these guys, the, the, the guys talking about the music on these radio stations. And then at a very young age, it, it, it left an impression on me thinking, that's what I want to do. I want to be on the radio. And this was before my teen years. I sort of decided this. And then um, when I got into high school, the principal of the high school said that wasn't the proper career to take, and that you know I I I um I needed to study to become a lawyer or a doctor or something, and then that really wasn't sort of on my radar. I didn't want to do that. I like music and I like radio, so it just was a natural thing for me to want to combine the two. My father, because I know one of your one of the questions that I got earlier on was, was about who was the most influential person in my life. And I looked to my father for that because my father told me that to, to make a living in life, find your passion and then find a way to make money following your passion. That way you'll always enjoy your job. You know, I hear from so many people who say, Oh, I'm so glad it's the weekend. My job sucks. Da, 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 da. Well, do something else. Do something you enjoy. Follow your passion always. I was looking at working in radio in the U.S. when I came here for a vacation in 1980. Um, and... I was lucky enough to be able to take care of, take, take advantage of some real cheap transatlantic airfares at the time. So a friend of mine and I came to California, to Orange County actually. We'd made some friends who lived in, in, in Dana Point. And uh, we came to visit them and I got to listening to some of the radio here. And I'm thinking, wow, this sounds cool. Maybe I should come here and work. <laughs> so. We, I, I came back and forth across the Atlantic a few times and, and wound up landing a job in San Clemente in 1982, and, uh, or actually late 1981. And um, I was doing mornings at a station called K-Wave, but they were very, very conservative and didn't like the fact that we were playing Hurt So Good by John Cougar because they thought that crossed the bounds of decency, if you will. So, and of course, I didn't agree, and uh, for my trouble, I was fired, and said, we don't uh, need you anymore, and that turned into uh, a blessing in disguise, because I came to say, I, I, I looked in LA at radio stations, and I looked in San Diego at radio stations, and I came down here and interviewed <coughs> with 100.7, I went to KGB, both of whom told me they weren't interested. And then I went to 91X, which actually wound up, it was my, my third choice at the time, and gave the guy, a t I thought I used a different approach there. I actually got face to face with the program director and gave him my tape. And he said, well, we'll call you. And I thought, okay, yeah, that's another, we'll call you, yeah. And uh, three weeks later, I got a phone call in the December of 1982 to come down and check out the studios, at which point I didn't know that the studios were across the border. 
in Tijuana. To me, their office was on Pacific Highway, and that's where business was done. But when I came down here, he said, well, you know, we've got to go on another car ride. I said, where? He said, the studio is just down the road some. <laughs> we wound up going through, across the border, up the hill to this little shack on top of the hill, and uh, I guess the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> This is an interesting and unique thing. Um, and I have found that um, there is a passion that people from south of the border have for the music that doesn't exist here. I need to know the answer to that question. Because I've seen, I've seen um, just, just for instance, you take somebody like the Smiths or Depeche Mode, or these guys, The Cure. The fan base is much bigger in Tijuana than it is here in San Diego. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't even aware at the time, when you're, when you're in a small room like this, and you're broadcasting to the outside world, you, it's, it's really hard to kind of wrap your head around seeing a number of people, uh, you know, it, to me, it's just me and the microphone. And if there's somebody listening, they're listening. Um, and you don't really think about that side of it. It's not until later on that I've come to appreciate that, um, especially from people south of the border. I mean, we've had an impact both sides of the border, I think. And I think it's a very unique situation here being a border town that we have the possible, you know, the, 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 um, Availability to to market into two different cities, speaking two different languages, and still come together with that common bond of music. Very unique. I mean, it doesn't exist too many. Detroit maybe with Canada, but you're looking at English English or English French. But you got that situation in El Paso and a couple of places, in Nogales along the border, where where you have these cross border towns, but it doesn't exist in the rest of the U.S. And I think. Uh, that, that makes it very unique, being in this market. Uh, radio will always exist. Not maybe in its current form, but I think it will always exist. There needs to be someone to be in the here and now, talking about things that are going on around the music. You don't get that so much online. And even if you do, you've generally got to pay for it some way or the other. Whereas over the air radio is free. You have a radio, turn it on, listen. You don't have to pay any subscriptions or anything like that. You can just listen. And I, I think to that end, it'll always be there. It's been through some rough times. And I think competition is there. But radio has the unique position to present better content, if you will, curated by people that, that know their business. And um, whether it's music radio or talk radio, I think it'll still exist in, in some form or the other. Um, I, think, I think that people who benefit from it are the listening public because they have so many choices. I mean, for instance, back before the internet, if you wanted to hear a certain song, you'd have to wait until it came on the radio, go buy it, record it off the radio, but you had limited options. Now, you want to hear a song? Instant gratification. I go on here, YouTube, boom, here's my song. Listen. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think, I think people still there's still a place for radio. There always will be, I think. I, 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 I'm I, and I know I'm probably biased because it's been my industry for years, but I think there will always be that, that place for radio. Can't I take more than three? I mean, <laughs> um, one album would be, because uh, there are so many, I mean, just so many. One would be probably 
Disintegration by The Cure. Really great album to listen to with headphones on. Um, I know it sounds kind of cliched, but The Wall, Pink Floyd. Sgt. Pepper was also another one of my favorite albums that I could listen to from start to finish and not skip over a track. That's the way I, my <coughs> way, way I, I tend to look at an album of work. If I can listen to it from start to finish and not feel like I've got to skip over a track, that has the mark of a great album in my mind. So there's three, but there are so, I mean, I wouldn't limit it to those three because there are so many, so many others. I mean, Under a Blood Bridge Sky by U2, Rattle and Hum by U2. Great albums to sit and, and listen to. But then, you see, if I could only take three records, maybe I could take one of these, which is about 16 gigs, and put about 100 records. <laughs> this is the way to do it. Um, but yeah, music's always going to be around. It's always going to be. I think it, the, there are ebbs and flows with great music, as you probably have noticed growing up. You know, you'll have some periods of time where there's some great music coming out, and other time, periods of time where there's, you know, there's nothing really good there. You know. There's a song by Madness that's sung in Spanish, but it's sung in Spanish Spanish, not Mexican Spanish. Un Paso Adelante, One Step Beyond, a really great version of that song. Um, but I, you know what, I, I mean, wh because I've spent a lot of time in Tijuana, one of the things I really like to really gets me in the right place is listening to a good mariachi band, you know. I've been to parties where mariachi band shows up and, hey, you know. <laughs> In 1987, we put on a concert at the racetrack, uh, Agua Caliente, and um, we had Oingo Boingo, The Fix, Chris Isaac, Squeeze, Hoodoo Gurus, The Bangles, and um, there were some people trying to get over the back fence trying to come in for free. And one of the uh, Mexican cops saw him, decided that he was gonna climb the fence and go after this guy. And somehow, his gun went off and he shot himself in the foot, trying to climb the fence. <laughs> I, I, I think that might be a misnomer, really. I, th I, I, I don't think there are more talented people there. I think people pay attention to some music, uh, to music over there, because over the years, things have been more limited in their availability in England. But um, I, can, I can give you an example of where because we're here in the United States and we look and see all this music that's coming here, okay? If you go there, all right, over the years, there's been an influx of American music. Motown, the Philadelphia sound, disco, etc., and on and on. Bruce Springsteen, you know, Billy Joel. So it, it, it's kind of a two-way street, I think. You know, music gets sent over here. Um, because I think you've you, you got, say for instance, in England you had somebody like Ian Curtis with Joy Division who sadly died. But then you look on the US side, you had Jim Morrison of The Doors who sadly died, doing a similar, being original with music. I mean, original music is, can be done anywhere. I, I, there's a lot of great music that comes out of the UK, but I think there's a lot that comes out of the U.S. as well, and Mexico and Australia. Canada is actually a very has a very thriving music industry as well. It's been a progression. I mean, the very first record that I had was, as I said earlier, a '78, which ran at 78 RPM, and it had a really big needle that you would have to change periodically and you just, there was a grip screw that held the needle in. It wasn't very delicate and that vibrated the needle, the sound came out of a big horn. Okay, and then electronics came along and 
they converted it to a sound wave and fed it up the tone arm to an amplifier and so on. In the recording industry, we've come leaps and bounds. I'm, there are pluses and minus with the technology. I still think analog is the most pure form of sound, but digital has come a long way. But then to work with, to, to as a producer, when you're putting tracks together, it's m much easier to do it digitally than it is analog. We, I mean, for what we used to do back in the day, you'd have this quarter-inch magnetic tape and you'd have a little slicing block, a splicing block and a razor blade and some sticky tape and you'd get a chalk pen, roll the tape up to where you want to make the edit, put a little chalk mark on, roll it onto where you want to make the next cut, put another chalk mark and then take that, put it in the block and slice it, right? Slice it on the other end and join it together. Now it's just cut and paste in audition with, with the desktop. It's, <laughs> it's come a long way. Um, and it, even in the world of, uh, uh, of the radio and transmitters, I mean, where we were, we're transmitting over the air with radio, but now digital has come along, presented a lot more opportunities, but a lot more competition as well. It's raw. It's emotional. They speak to a message that people can identify with. Um, and quite honestly, you can dance to it. You know, I mean, that's basically it. Uh, w why? Um, it's, it's reminiscent of the protest song era back in the 70s and late 60s, you know. Songs with a message. And, and, and R&B, uh, especially uh, hip hop and rap, uh, speaks to a social message that is being conveyed. If you listen real careful. That's why I think it's sort of grown. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've thought about doing that and maybe sometime in the future I might. I mean, a lot of what I do is because I, you know, I work with music and, and one of the shows I do, I don't even speak in, it's called Subculture. It's, um, it's a mix show of classic alternative dance tunes that runs on our sister station, the dance station called Clo. But I can't podcast any of that because it's not legal. I'd have to, um, it costs a lot of money to pay the licensing fees to be able to share that stuff, as much as I'd love to. But people can tune in every Friday night at nine on Glo, San Diego. I would marginally go Depeche, but I love them both. Vinyl. <laughs> I love This is my home. So, this is the U.S. Tacos. Water. No alcohol. Juice. Orange juice. <laughs> but if I was to choose, I'd probably go beer, because wine gives me headaches. <laughs>